Thank you. Um, good morning and a warm welcome to the 15th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2022. Um, today, we, um, Stuart McMillan will be joining us slightly late at 9.30 as a substitute for Jenny Minto and uh, Dr Allen has indicated he has to leave early at 11am. Our first agenda item is decision taking business in private. Are members content to take agenda item four in private? Thank you very much. Um, we move to agenda item two, which is the Scottish Government Resource Spending Review. Um, I now welcome to committee uh, Kate Forbes, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Economy, Angus Robertson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for Constitution, External Affairs and Culture, mm. and Kirsty White, Team Leader of Resource Spending Review, Scottish Government, and Penelope Cooker. Cooper, sorry, Director of Culture and Major Events at the Scottish Government. And uh, thank you very much for um, coming to committee this morning. Um, can I open with a question for Ms Forbes, first of all. Uh, the submission on the spending review highlighted the need to reappraise the contribution of cultural activities in terms of wider societal benefits, including health and wellbeing. And the committee agreed with COSLA um, uh, evidence that stated a need for a whole system approach. Um, could you let us know how you, what extent you factored culture as applied to a whole system approach in this re review? Thanks very much, um, and it's great to be able to join the committee this morning. I think for me, that question goes right to the heart of one of the, uh, the opportunities through the resource spending review. We have talked at length over the last uh, few years, certainly since Christie was published, about the importance of preventative spend. But preventative spend requires reform. It requires us to uh, essentially be able to move budget lines over the longer term, knowing that if we invest in certain areas up front, for example, like culture, like our environment, and there's a few other examples, then we ultimately relieve pressure at the more acute end. Now, over the course of our, an annual budget, that can be very challenging to do. And a resource spending review allows us to look over a three, four year timeframe um, and, and, and try and shift that. So I would emphasize that the resource spending review is very much the beginning of the process. So it sets out spending parameters. It's not the final budget for subsequent years, but it gives us the spending parameters. And you know, I, I'm sure we'll get into the discussion around um, some of the challenges right now, particularly uh, facing uh, culture and, and other lines um, in the spending review. But it does allow us that multi-year uh, reform. And the fact that we've uh, worked extremely hard to protect the culture lines albeit in cash terms rather than real terms, because inflation is eating our spending power and there's no way around that. Uh, the fact that we have uh, sought very hard to protect in cash terms that the culture line demonstrates that we're serious about trying to shift that balance. Thank you. Um, if I could ask Mr Robertson a question, um, very much on, on, on the back of uh, Ms Forbes' answer around um, the cost of living crisis and inflation and what's happening, um, I'm interested in the available data and participation in cultural activity um, from the National Performance Framework, particularly the lower participation mm -hmm. of people from more deprived areas. And I just wondered if you had any um, view on how we could increase participation at, given the challenges ahead. Yeah, well, I think I mean, there's, <clears throat> I think that's a very opposite question because it is, it's a consideration not just for the for the Scottish government, uh, but it's also a consideration for uh, the likes of, for example, uh, national museums and galleries. Um, I, I was yesterday meeting their trustees, and this is exactly one of the areas that was being talked about. Um, and they were observing the changes that they've been able to see over the last 25 years, which has seen a change in the, the picture, a much broader representation of uh, people attending the likes of the National Museum uh, of Scotland, but there, there, are others, uh, there are other museums too, but that there is, there's still a gap uh, to be bridged there. And I think to echo um, my Cabinet Secretary colleagues' um, observations a moment ago, by um, embarking on this uh, approach, um, it is going to, uh, I think, encourage all of us to make sure that we're thinking about all of these things, because one of the, 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 um, the potential ways to, to deal with times of constraint uh, 
is to increase the numbers of people who are attending and using our cultural institutions um, of all backgrounds and to help increase the number of uh, people, say for example children from deprived backgrounds, um, how does one make sure that there's more school participation in museums, in galleries and, and, and everything else. So these, these are considerations that are very much in our minds in, in Scottish Government, but I know that they are also in, in institutions as well, and they see it as part of their, um, part, part of their tasking in the, in the years uh, to come, and we're, we're going to work very much on a collegial basis to try and work out in which ways we can help and in which ways they're going to be able to manage to do that themselves. Thank you very much. I'm now going to move to uh, questions from committee members. I'll, I'll ask Mr Cameron. To... Uh, thank you, convener. Um, the general question, firstly, uh, the uh, spice briefing that we've been provided shows that there will be an estimated real terms fall of 7.8% in, the, in uh, Angus Robertson's budget uh, between 2022-3 and 26 7 uh, Within that, the funding for culture and major events would fall in real terms by an estimated 4.7 per cent. Um, you'll well know how scarred the culture sector is, in particular, by the pandemic. Uh, and the committee's done a lot of work on, on funding in, in the sector. Um, there is a major concern, particularly within the more organic, informal parts of the sector, uh, about their funding. And I would just like to get your response to what is a, a predicted cut in, in funding. Well, I would say that, uh, yes, in, in that part of the cultural world, but across the whole of the cultural world, um, there has been an immense challenge getting through uh, the COVID period. It was, I think, um, the, the second to, to worst impacted part of the, the Scottish economy. Um, and for people uh, living in, and working in the cultural and arts community, it was an extremely testing time. And I'm very proud of the level of resource that the Scottish Government made available uh, to individuals, to cultural organisations, um, to make sure that uh, they could get uh, through it. And now we're faced with um, the resource picture that we, um, uh, that we are uh, having to live within in the years uh, to come. And we are going to have to work very closely with all parts of the cultural community uh, to make sure that we are able to protect it and, and foster it as best as we can, given these constraints. Um, and whether one is a smaller, organic, community-based uh, cult cultural organisation or one is involved in a very large uh, project uh, which requires a lot of funding, everybody is going to be looking at the bottom line, everybody is going to try and work out how they can manage uh, given uh, the resource constraints which exist, and we're going to have to be innovative, all of us, in making sure that we're able to deliver the uh, level of cultural provision that we all want to see, and to do it within the means that are at our disposal. Thank you for that. Can I ask uh, specifically about HES, yeah. um, which sees, I think, a, a 2022 three figure of 61 million uh, decreasing to 48 million in 26, 27. Um, can I just ask you, for why, why is that line in, in, in the review? Well, can I uh, underline uh, the distinction that my Cabinet Secretary colleague made uh, before about the difference between a resource spending review and a budget? It is not the same thing, point one. Point two, um, I think uh, Historic Environment Scotland is uh, an organisation which is significantly better funded in global terms than other parts of the, uh, the, the portfolio. Uh, and so it's fair to say that absolutely everybody is having to play their part in making sure that we are able to, to live, within our, uh, live within our means. But I'm, you know, I am the first to acknowledge that uh, HES as an organisation, because of the particular responsibilities it has, point one and point two, the specific nature of the challenge of the estate that HES is having to, to look after, um, I acknowledge that this is an area of significant challenge. Um, but, you know, firstly, the point about this being a spending review and not a budget, point one and point two, uh, that this is the beginnings of a process of working with all organisations, including HES, to work out how it is that we can manage through uh, the next years. 
and also be imaginative about uh, whether there is the potential for uh, additional and parallel funding streams. It's one of the areas that I'm extremely keen to explore to make sure that um, hopefully not everybody is going to have to deal with the constraints that the resource spending review points to as an, as an envelope, but I'm highlighting the point that it isn't, it isn't a budget projection. I mean, do, you, do you think that one of the reasons potentially why the, the, the HES figure is decreasing is that um, increased visitor numbers may, may mean that the, the government grant, as it were, decreases and, and, and the hope that numbers go up? Yeah, that's most certainly part of the, the consideration. I think all committee members realise that uh, all of our institutions which have a high throughput, a high number of people that will, uh, that will, will visit, um, have in recent years seen that income level you know, uh, fall off a cliff. Um, I, I don't have the HES numbers at the, the, the forefront of my mind. I can, I can just as, as an example, share the one which I remember because yesterday was at the, the National Museums. They pre COVID, their annual visitor numbers were 3 million, and la in, in this last year, they managed to recover to 1.5. Um, so it, it's an illustration of the fact that there's still a way to go, um, but I do think that there's a huge opportunity if, if we, in the royal sense, all of us, the institutions, government, and um, everybody else that is involved with the culture and art sector is able to uh, help give people confidence um, uh, to go back to museums, galleries, events, um, and we do what the convener um, was highlighting, which is make the most of the untapped, um, unincluded thus far parts of population that have not been able to make best use of things. And I think that that will have an impact, and hopefully for those who, for whom this is an income stream, uh, it will see them be in, be in a better financial position than they would have been uh, otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Payak. Convener, um, just to follow on the question from Donald Cameron, I take your point about visitor numbers mm. um, are hope, hopefully going to go up as we recover from the pandemic. But one of the things that is concerning is about the properties that Historic yes. Environment Scotland manage yes. but aren't reopening and the discussion paper about what happens to those properties. Do we let them um, face managed decline because of climate change? Yeah. Um, it's part of our history, it's part of our culture, so you're saying not to worry because it's only a spending review, it's not the budget. Is that a suggestion that there might be um, capital investment that might flow to historic environment Scotland that would mean they could actually repair and keep those buildings fit for purpose? Yep. So I, I'm, I'm not saying no reason to worry. Um, I, you know, I'm, I, I suspect, like other members of the, the, the committee, I uh, I care passionately about our heritage um, and th the fact that um, our built heritage, much of it very old, is facing environmental uh, uh, degradation, which leads to instability and, and dangers, which leads to the requirement to maintain and, and, um, uh, and support uh, castles and old buildings and, and all the rest of Scotland's uh, built heritage. You know, this, this was going to be a challenge with or without a resource spending review. Um, and uh, it would have been a challenge if we were sitting here discussing the budget line, which we're not. Um, so I'm, I'm saying to you, I totally acknowledge that um, there is a major challenge for historic environment Scotland in general, because of the nature of the estate, the nature of the, uh, de the, the decline in the, um, in the built infrastructure, uh, and we are going to have to work uh, very closely to work out how we can maximise uh, the, the uh, resources that Historic Environment Scotland has from ourselves and from elsewhere um, to make sure that we can uh, protect um, our historic sites around uh, the country. I mean, these are the things, I mean, just to stress a point that has been made both by Kate Forbes and, and myself already, these are the issues that are at the heart of the discussions that are beginning to take place, beginning to take place with cultural organisations, beginning to take place with trade unions, beginning to take place with trustees, beginning, these are the conversations that are now um, uh, are now happening, given that we are having 
um, uh, the information that we now have from re the resource spending review. And it behoves all of us to be as imaginative as we can be to work out what is it that we can do with the resources that we have in constrained circumstances to do what we need to do to protect the likes of um, the built um, heritage uh, in Scotland. And, and, and the first to acknowledge that this is not a simple task. It is not going to be easy, um, uh, not just in a financial sense, but also in uh, all the other uh, considerations that we have, have to be given, given the size of the estate that HES is responsible for. We could probably do the whole evidence session, convener, just on you know, HES and the nature of the, the, the <coughs> challenge that it's, it's uh, facing. But you know, this is absolutely there at the top of my uh, inbox as an area where we in government need to work with our agencies and armed length organisations to make sure they're able to do what they are they are supposed to be able to do. Thanks for that, because it is about uh, the buildings it and the land it. as well as the staff. Yes, so yes, thinking yes. about both those budget yes, lines I think is critical. Yep. Is it okay to come in with a different follow-up question, yeah. Convener? Mm -hmm. Thanks yeah. very much. Um, there was a, a comment, um, we've been told that it's about the whole government responding. And when we had the Cabinet Secretary for Health in front of us, there was a lot of talk of social prescribing, as the convener has said. Um, but one of the things that comes out in the, um, the, res this, the resource framework issue is about local expenditure on culture. And the evidence we got from Audit Scotland was that if you look at the local government benchmarking framework data over the last decade, that services like culture and leisure services have taken the biggest cut of almost 30 per cent over the last decade. So looking at the local government budget going forward, how do we join up the gap? Because the need for social prescribing, local community arts facilities, who's going to pay for that given the huge pressures on local authorities? I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary for Finance would like yeah, to comment. I mean, I, th I think it's a, an excellent question because, again, if I look right now at the, the challenging outlook, and I, I'm not going to sit here and say it's anything other than challenging, I think I've been quite open and, uh, and honest about uh, the fact that it is a challenging outlook um, right across the board. But the only way, therefore, that we are going to achieve our objectives, for example, on social prescribing, on preventative spend, on protecting culture, is if we ensure that we are not working at cross purposes across the public sector landscape. So we need to be as good as possible in terms of uh, joined up thinking. So you're talking specifically there about uh, local government. Now, you'll know that the local government lines that we have uh, published are at level two, which means what you don't see is all the transfers that go from the Scottish government to local government. Uh, some of those are fairly substantial in terms of education, in terms of social care. But there's a whole host of other lines, which I know um, sometimes um, frustrates COSLA, a whole host of other lines uh, across portfolios that are transferred in. And we're working with COSLA right now to look at how we, how we de-ring fence more of those. The challenge is that it then means that certain areas um, are not it don't necessarily deliver the aims that we intend. So there's a fine line between how you determine Scottish Government funding going towards purposes like culture, like leisure and so on, and how you give that maximum freedom and flexibility to local government. But obviously, uh, Angus uh, Robertson can speak more about how, uh, from a policy perspective, it's joined up. Uh, my job is to make sure from a financial perspective it's joined up. Uh, and I think there's more that we need to do and certainly the Resource Spending Review provides us with a framework for doing that because it does two things. It boils down what our core objectives are and says, right, let's make sure that we're actually achieving these. And secondly, it says to the public sector at large, let's get better, let's get more flexible in actually working together to achieve these aims. That applies across public bodies, so it applies, it'll apply across uh, culture bodies, but it also applies across Scottish Government and local government to say, where can we get more joined up rather than working at cross purposes? Can, you know, can I just add to that and say that in addition to that, there's also the other end of the telescope, which is cultural organisations and cult cultural institutions themselves coming forward and saying, we have something to offer in this space. And I su suppose that, that is an example of what can and hopefully will come out of uh, this exercise, which is having to rethink how we are able to deliver um, uh, certain priorities across government. 
uh, and it is by working in partnership with organisations, and, and Sarah Boyack is absolutely right to highlight how important local government is in that, but there are others in addition to that, and I go back to my example of being at the, the National Museum of Scotland yesterday and saying to their trustees, what, what are you thinking about? Um, because uh, our, our museums, and they're not all based in Edinburgh, um, and they're in different parts of the, uh, the country, and there are other institutions in, uh, right across Scotland as well, that um, lend themselves very well to being able to provide the kind of services that social prescribing uh, can offer, but it also uh, means that they are going to have to think about how they can make that accessible and understandable um, to practitioners who would then have to prescribe. And you know, members here will, will remember the evidence session with with Hamza Youssef, where we were we were beginning to explore what is it that we are going to need to do in the next years to make sure that those who are likely to um, want to uh, use social uh, prescribing, then know what facilities are available to them. And that's why this kind of exercise is not an unforeseen consequence. I think it's actually at the heart of it, of making everybody think, OK, so what, what is it that we need to be more innovative? So it's not necessarily about the cash drive um, or the, um, the constraints that there are, but it's about what is it that we can do differently to make sure that we're using our, the, the resources of our museums and galleries and, and so on um, to fulfil that purpose. Yeah, I appreciate that. So mm. are we at the point where we need a strategy to actually pull this together so that people know what's happening next and it's accelerated given the points the Cabinet Secretary for Finance made about mm. the Christie principles? Because yep. the evidence we got from UCL was was really important about the access to arts for children, people with mental health issues, and using the arts to reduce the physical decline of people in older age. Yep. So we are working together on it, and I can, I can, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to give Sarah Boyack a comfort on, on that. That officials between the Culture Directorate and others um, are uh, discussing in an ongoing basis how is it that we take all of this forward. But I was just taking the opportunity to highlight. That the point that I think shouldn't be lost in all of this is that there are more actors involved in this than just government, and we're needing to make sure that we involve all of them too. So, you know, that is something that needs to be taken forward, and we need to make sure that um, uh, we're, we're trying to do that at pace, but involving everybody that needs to be involved in it. Could I add just to that? Because um, it goes back to the first question that was asked around preventative spend. Whenever I set out a budget or I set out a spending review, obviously all the focus will be on any lines that decrease. But if we're serious about preventative spend, so if we're serious, for example, about what I think Sarah Boyack has touched on, which I think is, is exceptional, again, around ensuring that we're investing up front with a view to reducing pressure at an acute level, then inevitably the some lines are going to have to go down in order to supplement other lines going up. And therefore, that requires a far more mature debate, I think, amongst politicians about that shift. Because you'll know, and I've used this before in the Environment Committee, if I were to shift budget from, let's say, an acute care setting to uh, investing in, 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 in parks or in, in our environment or in our culture, you know what the debate's going to be like. So I think if we're all serious, it, it's as much about government being scrutinised, obviously, about getting this right, as it is about having a more general intelligent debate, I think, about the very issues that, that Sarah's, Sarah Boyack is uh, touching on, because I think that's the only way we are going to get through the next few years, which are going to be challenging. Did you I look, look back in? I look forward to seeing that strategy, and I hope it's soon, not yeah. into the future. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask a supplementary question as well. Um, as uh, Ms Forbes, you mentioned at the very start about how this is a... Um, it's a step change in, in attitudes, and, mm. and, and while we, we've all adopted the Christie principles as being the right way forward, the progress has been really, really slow. But also, um, the spending review, as you say, it's level two this time because of the um, inflationary pressures, and it's, it's not, you, you know, um, tenable to go any further down at this stage for this. But it's also outcomes focused. So, can you tell us a little bit about how you're going to measure? the outcomes when it is about, you know, preventative spend and well-being and, you know, the, these kind of principles. Yeah, and it is intentional, intentionally outcomes-focused. Um, 
So we have prioritised certain areas, and, and you'll have heard me say it before, but I'm just going to repeat it again. Tackling child poverty, transitioning to net zero, uh, resilient public services and economic recovery. Now, three of these were included in the budget, um, and we added resilient public services spending review, because, of course, when you boil down priorities, uh, you know, there are some areas in our, our public um, uh, landscape that may not obviously lend themselves to the other three priorities, but we're still going to keep funding them because they're important. But those are the, the, the priorities. In terms of how we measure that, we obviously have metrics already in place. So the resource spending review is not uh, independent of, for example, the Tackling Child Poverty Plan, the Child Poverty Plan. So that sets out quite clearly what our measures are. And you see that running through the spending review. You'll see, for example, in another portfolio, in my own economy and finance, you'll see the employability line going up because that's funding the commitments we made in the Tackling Child Poverty Plan. Um, transitioning to net zero, we know what our metrics are um, to be net zero. Um, and uh, in terms of economic recovery, we've set out in the COVID recovery plan. So these things are not, that, those are how we measure them. This is about trying to align the inputs to what we've set out as outcomes. And normally in a budget, you start with the inputs. You start with, this is the money we have available, and you try and squeeze as many commitments as possible into that funding. What we did here is, there's our commitments, there's our priorities, and we work backwards uh, from that. Obviously, that's going to require not an awful lot of innovation. And I think my last point would be, I think actually the culture sector has led to the way already when it comes to demonstrating effective innovation. If you think of some of the commitments that I've set out or the objectives I've set out around innovation, maximising public value from our assets, um, if you think about you know, the, the points around efficiency, the culture sectors can teach the rest of the public sector, I think, a lot about how to do that well. Okay. Um, Dr Allen? Yes, thanks. It was um, just a su supplementary question really on, on that very point, which is um, um, about innovation. And this was something that came up when Mr Yusuf um, was uh, in the committee. We were talking about um, how to ensure that there is buy-in, not just in, in government, which there clearly is, to the idea um, of social prescribing or spending to save, but that there's buy-in from the agencies that will be delivering health, health boards not least, and I just wonder um, what work is being done to ensure that there is a cultural change, if you like, within health boards that would facilitate that. Well, the, forgive me, I should probably have uh, mentioned health boards in my reply to, to Sarah Boyack in terms of uh, partners as part of this uh, process, because um, uh, it, you know, everybody who is involved um, I go back to my telescope, regardless of which way you look down the telescope, you're going to work back from the individual uh, all the way back to who is it that thinks that that individual needs some intervention or support of a form that is, has not conventionally been, been prescribed. And that involves a number of uh, organisations, you know, na national government, local government, health boards, um, the cultural sector, cultural organisations, and then individual GP practices, and, and there's probably some other links in the chain that I haven't uh, mentioned there. And uh, yeah, everybody's going to need to play a part in it. And I think you know Sarah Boyack's point on, on strategy is, is, is well made. For, for me, as important to that is having the confidence that all of the links in the chain are going to play their part. We can have as many strategies as you like about things. Um, we're dealing with something which is, I say, a relatively new innovation in terms of who has, a, who has adopted successful models of, of making this uh, happen. And what we're trying to do is introduce this here as quickly as we possibly can. Um, but to make that work, it is going to take quite a lot of different organisations, institutions, and then at the end of the day, individuals, if you remember the evidence session we're talking about, how many GPs are going to take out their little contact book of, well, here are the types of organisations that are available in the Western Isles, um, that one could socially prescribe um, a, a patient perhaps uh, making use of. And you know, that's the last part of it, is that we have to make sure that this is available everywhere and not just in, in some places. So I'm, I'm acknowledging the fact that you know, there are quite a lot of links in this chain to make sure that it works. 
and there is a, a broad geographical spread, and we need to make sure that it's something that's available to all, because you know, healthcare is there for everywhere, everybody at the point of need. Um, so, you know, the point's well made that it's something that needs to be got on with, but at the same time, I think there is also an awareness that if it were so simple, it would have been done already, and you know, it's a mixture of pull and push is going to be required to make sure that this actually happens. But, you know, going back to the conversations I was having yesterday, just as a reflection of things, people are very aware of this. Um, and I think people are turning their attentions to how is it that they can play their part in it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jessica? Yeah, uh, interesting um, responses from you both on, on the prevention um, question. And, and I suppose it is difficult to see, though, within the RSR, exactly how that preventive approach is, is being driven through. I mean, you, you talk a lot about culture and about changing the way that public services are, are working, but it's hard to actually see a, a budget line shifting within mm. health towards culture, well-being, mm -hmm. or, or whatever. It's part of the issue here about the time scale that, that budgets are, are addressing. I mean, obviously, it's very hard to show the impact of preventative spend within one year. I, I would say probably very hard to show it within three to four years as well. So is there something about having that longer term look as we have with wider strategies and how do we then frame that within, a, within the short term budgets that we always have to look at, including RSR? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it, felt, um, it felt challenging enough setting out a four year spending review at a time like this. So setting out anything longer, I think, would be, would be really difficult. But the four year period, even that has allowed us, I think, to not only set out obviously these spending parameters and that's what they are they are spending parameters but to have some uh, very important conversations internally as you can imagine the process for getting to this publication is not simple and perhaps you know not um, uh, not going back on what, what i've already said but I, we took a very different approach to the spending review than we normally take to budgets a budget process internally is normally a case of here's your allocations based presumably on last year plus an inflationary uplift um, tell me how much you can achieve for that budget what we did here was say right before we get to the numbers let's look at outcomes let's look at the need for reform and let's look at the post covid post brexit landscape of what we want to achieve and we started with those cross ministerial discussions about outcomes and then built the budget around that so obviously that you know there's a limit to that because you still have to maintain your public services you know you still have to and that's why i worked extremely hard to try and protect budget lines in in cash terms i accept um, across the board but you will also see a particular focus on, on, on the core objectives. Um, so that is starting the process. Now, what I would, I would hope is that subsequent budgets reflect that priority. So I would hope that future settlements, i.e. in advance of next year's budget, are moving in a more positive direction than we think. One would hope that, because remember that the spending review is based on the UK government spending review of autumn last year, when inflation was 3.1%, we're at 9%, it's gone up to 11% based on Bank of England uh, forecasts. So I would assume that the UK government is going to have to take into account inflation, and therefore there might be an uplift now. That uplift might not translate into spending power because it just accommodates uh, the inflationary uplift. But in that event, we will continue to, 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 to invest along the lines of our, of our objectives. Um, and I guess my appeal, and you've heard my, my appeal too many times probably to count, is that when we get to that point, we have that intelligent debate in Parliament that nearly always happens in committees, which is, let's, not, let, let's, let's accept that if we're serious about preventive spend, that will mean budget lines moving. So you might see you know, some of the acute services releasing some funding <laughs> to elsewhere because you know that that ultimately reduces the pressure on, on the acute line. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I have much to, to, to add to that. I mean, I think that the, the, the logic is, is sound. Um, the making it work in practice is the challenge, isn't it? Mm. Um, and uh, 
uh, we are going to have to be um, uh, mindful of, and, and you know, this is going to be the subject of your deliberations and myself and the Cabinet Secretary and others coming back on a reg regular basis as we are and saying, okay, is that switch beginning to happen? Is there any bite that we're able to see progress being made on uh, things that can give you the confidence to say, well, this strategy, this approach is working? It's certainly been pursued. Mm -hmm. At what point is it working? When will we begin to see that? Well, you know, that depends on how quickly we get up and running mm -hmm. uh, doing some of these things. But and, and another observation that I don't think necessarily makes things any easier is that some things, I think, um, may take longer to change than some other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and I don't, I don't know which those might be and how long they might be. But I just, I think it kind of echoes the point that Kate Forbes was saying about having a, uh, having a, a mature debate about some of these things. If we're, if we are agreed in general terms that this is the best way to go go forward, and I think there's large scale consensus that it probably is, then we have to find our feet through working our way through this uh, process. Um, and I, I know I'm committed to making uh, it happen. And I'm, you know, as I've said to the committee uh, before, I'm very interested in any ideas or pointers that, that you and other colleagues in the committee have uh, to ensure that government is thinking about how it can be make, make some things work faster, some things work work in different ways. Um, and you know, are there any areas that are being missed as part of this process? Mm -hmm. Because. You know, it is one of the, the models of how the Scottish Parliament is supposed to be working. And in this sense, we are a collegiate whole and trying to make sure that we're able to deliver, particularly on big yeah. cultural uh, changes in how we do our business. I mean, would you see, for example, a role for a future generations commissioner in taking that very long term view about well-being and investment, whether it's culture, whether it's our wider, wider well-being? I, I wouldn't rule anything like that out. I mean, I think we, we need to be open to suggestions of what can make sure that we understand things as well as, as we can and make sure that we're doing everything that we can. I'd, I'd need to know more about the proposal, um, but I'm, I'm open to suggestions, as I've just said a moment ago, mm. about ways in which we can ensure that we're mm. uh, leading uh, the change that we know that's necessary. Okay. Um, I had a couple of um, specific questions. So um, what, one is about national cultural events. Um, I think we're all looking forward to the World um, Cycling Championships coming to Scotland uh, next year. Um, but I suppose what, what's kind of noticeable looking at the marketing for that is that there doesn't seem to be a contribution from the UK government to an event which will still largely be seen as a GB sporting event. Um, can you give some background as to, as to why that, that's the case? Has that been a conscious decision? or? I'm, I'm going to have to, I think, I mean, you have raised a question in, in relation to mm. this uh, before in as much as that it's the Scottish Government that's playing a, the significant role um, in terms of funding from a public sector point of view. I'd, I'd need to write uh, to Mr. Ruskell uh, about where we are with, with UK Government funding in relation to, uh, to that. I would say in, in general terms, um, there's a great deal of work that is going into uh, both uh, the World Cycling uh, Championships, as, and I think certainly the committee will be aware of this, but people perhaps watching the proceedings might not be, it is the first example of World Cycling Championships bringing all of the different disciplines. I think from memory there are 13, please don't ask me to name them all, but there are 13 different cycling um, uh, uh, disciplines taking part in this. And um, at, at venues throughout the mm -hmm. length and yep. breadth of Scotland, yep. um, point one, it's unprecedented in scale. Mm -hmm. I think I'm right in saying that it is of the order of the Commonwealth Games. I mean, it is a huge event that's taking place here. Um, and a major part of the consideration is yes, how is it organised? Yes, how is it funded? Um, yes, how do we do that in these constrained times? But there's an awful lot of thought is going into what, what are the societal benefits of an event like that? What is, uh, what is an event like that going to do to make more of us use our bikes uh, and to change um, our attitudes towards uh, health and well-being? Um, so yes, it is, you know, there are, there are cash questions, absolutely, and I will write back to Mr. Ruskell on that okay. so that, that he has the, the, uh, the latest uh, statistics. Um, but, you know, I'm also minded, and this goes to the heart of the, the points that we've been making, that there are considerations as part of this which you, you can't enumerate in cash terms mm -hmm. and are part of the wider agenda that we have in terms of health and well-being 
um, uh, that are a very important part of it as well. Okay. Um, I mean, obviously, government is very constrained, as is local government, in terms of the, the tools that government has to raise revenue. Um, one tool that could be available to national parks and local authorities would be a visitor levy. Um, so I'm interested to know what your, your thinking is on that and how that could be used to invest in cultural assets and visitor experiences. I mean, I would imagine most people, for example, going to Sky, uh, hundreds of thousands of people every year would, would probably not bulk up paying a couple of pounds to support, you know, car parks at the ferry pools or, you know, better toilet facilities or investment in cultural heritage on the island. So um, I, I'm interested in what, what the thinking is in government on that in these very straightened times, how do we get that contribution from visitors who are enjoying Scotland mm. into our communities in a way that we can help to make them thrive? Maybe if I update on visitor levy and then uh, Angus Robertson might want to add um, on the culture side. Just um, briefly on the, on the Sky example, I mean, it, it, it's an excellent example of the point that Sarah Boyack was making around bringing together community, local government, Scottish government, with a little bit of investment in infrastructure and then the requirement to raise revenue from parking facilities or otherwise. The infrastructure has massively improved, the visitor experience has massively improved, the local experience has massively improved, and there's now a revenue stream for the local community that can be invested in. For example, they've bought a, a, a local community bus. So I think it's a, a, a fantastic example. And um, you know that kind of thing isn't necessarily covered in a resource spending review, but it's the smaller pots of money that can absolutely unlock community empowerment. We are committed to introducing uh, a visitor levy. I stated in the budget that's just passed um, in the letter to local authorities that we were committed to introducing it. Um, we believed um, that there were two caveats, one that we needed to consult with industry, uh, and secondly, that uh, we were conscious of the sort of post-pandemic impact on the tourism industry. Um, but that, that commitment, and, and I think, um, you know, as we take forward the fiscal framework review with local government uh, has got to feature. Um, obviously, we've set out that it would be, uh, well, we set this out in the past, but it would be, it would be local. So, you know, I think this is where it could really work alongside local authorities and local communities and businesses to release a bit of funding for greater investment and, again, improve all those experiences. But I suppose the bottom line is that we, we, we are still committed to introducing it along the lines of with those two caveats. Mm. Um, <clears throat> well, if I can join the MSP for Sky, talking about Sky as uh, the MSP for Edinburgh Central, um, um, uh, can I say how strongly I'm in favour of uh, the, the visitor levy? This, this is the norm in parts of the world that have significant tourist numbers and as, as people who travel ourselves, I think we, we are used to that and I'm, I'm perfectly content to, to make a, a financial contribution to places that I visit to make sure that um, both the visitor experience is everything that it can be, that for people who live there, th their quality of life and their public services is as well supported as, as possible. Um, I think um, uh, obviously this is where we, we get into the heart of a debate about empowering localities to make the appropriate decisions for their locality and the extent to which there is national guidance around, you know, here are good things to be thinking about. You know, no doubt we'll be, be talking about this at greater length, but I think um, the, the literally millions of people who visit uh, the likes of uh, Edinburgh will have um, little to no difficulty in paying um, uh, the kind of levy that they would be paying in any other uh, capital as part of their overnight costs. Um, and it is a revenue stream that I think could be transformational in many different ways, but it, it will involve um, local decision makers having innovative ideas and, and, and putting their focus in the, the right areas to get maximum, mm -hmm. um, uh, maximum benefit from such a fin funding stream. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Golden, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks convener. Uh, perhaps I'd first of all just pick up a point that Kate Forbes made around um, increased uh, UK government public expenditure. And I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary accepts that there's a tricky balancing act with this because increased UK government public expenditure will also fuel inflation. So while in cash terms it's a benefit, in real terms it could be problematic as well. Um, yes and no. So 
I, you know, there, there's a principle there, which I, I understand. But on the other hand, right now, we are, for example, eating into our own budget to a greater extent because the UK government's spending plans haven't been updated in light of inflation. And, and I think it's inevitable that inflation is going to have an impact on UK government capital initiatives. It's going to have an impact on, on perhaps even pay policy. It's, there's no avoiding the fact that citizens are you know, struggling with the cost of living and inflation is having an impact on, on uh, spending. And so my difficulty is that because our last, basically, information on UK government spending plans was last autumn, what would be really helpful is to have updated spending plans, which would allow me to then build a spending review on the, the latest information. So we already have a bit of a challenge with um, different forecasters. The OBR obviously forecasts most recently in March. Uh, it was just on the cusp of war in Ukraine and so on. The SFC, which is what we base our numbers on, uh, forecast obviously just last week. So it, I guess the point I'm making here is around different timescales. And I think it's inevitable that the UK government will have to update it. But all I've got to go on is something that's about nine months old. Uh, so there's a principle, yes, that you've touched on, which I understand and accept, but I think it's inevitable that the UK government's going to be contending with the same inflationary impacts that we are, and it would be enormously helpful to know where that changes their original spending plans, because it's inevitable it has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for that, and uh, perhaps open it up slightly. And in terms of looking at increased visitor numbers to uh, ameliorate some of the costs, uh, some of the cuts to cultural organisations. Has there been any assessment on the cost of living crisis and therefore consumer spending, which in this case isn't driving inflation, as to whether that's a realistic proposition? Yeah, I mean, that, this, is, this is why I think we have the right priorities in the spending review, because you know, what we have done is try and target, let's take the, the cost of living crisis response and the tackling child poverty response here. We have intentionally, for example, funded a fairer uh, social security system. We are uh, proud of our commitment to increasing the Scottish child payment. And there are also in terms of the employability lines I talked about in terms of helping more people into work. All of these areas are designed to try and alleviate some of the cost of living pressures, but not all, because we don't have control over things like energy. But if we can raise people out of poverty or, or, or protect them from falling into poverty, which is essentially what you're talking about in terms of cost of living, we know that that reduces pressures on, on, on public services. We know that, um, and this is, comes through the discussion I had with the Finance Committee on, on Tuesday, we know that th they are more likely to, to spend too. You know, I, and that's where it's a, it's, a, it's a balance where the more targeted the funding, you know, those, th they are more likely to spend than those who, who save. So I think you know, I'm trying to carefully articulate a point, which is that if you target your spending at those who need it the most and who are more likely to spend it, then it not only protects them from uh, poverty or takes them out of poverty, which is the intention, it also reduces public pressure on public services and has an economic boost because it, consumers are spending. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that? Because um, um, Morris uh, uh, Golden has um, thrown a pebble in the pond for me because uh, talking about the issue of visitor numbers, when I was talking before about the visitor numbers for um, the National Museum being at one and a half million rather than three million, it, uh, a sort of light went on with me. <laughs> I don't know if it did with anybody else. Uh, given that we haven't seen the full return to inter with international visitor numbers, mm -hmm. And it seems to me that we're obviously what we are seeing is more confidence in domestic um, uh, visitors. Uh, call it a staycation. It may be people not travelling very far to go to uh, different cultural um, uh, institutions. Uh, 
Uh, and so I think there's, there's, that gives us some hope, I think, that maybe part of the c small c cultural change that there's been because of the COVID pandemic is that perhaps people are more open to exploring what is on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. And you know, maybe there's something in that for all of us in, in realizing the opportunity that there is, yes, because of the societal advantages that we know it brings for you know, absolutely everybody to be able to make use of them, but realizing that this is a phenomenon which is happening. It's something I'm, I'm you know, thank you for asking the question in the way that you've asked it, because it's made me want to understand that a little bit better, because it shouldn't just be a passing fad, because there's a way of keeping that whilst also attracting people to come back. And I think we're all beginning to see those uh, those um, those international visitors on our streets, and they're very welcome. But it's what can we do to ensure that those people who perhaps haven't been going in the past to use and visit cult cultural organisations and institutions closer to home, that they are indeed doing that. Just saying, incidentally, um, people were standing queuing outside the National Museum for Scotland yesterday before it opened which I thought was just a tremendous uh, straw in the wind and just walking past you could hear, yes, it was people who were visiting, but you know, lots of families, lots of people who were clearly from here or not far from here, um, uh, who, who were going and were you know, wanting to wait in the rain uh, in Chamber Street to go to the, I, th I think that's a good sign, but there's something in that that Mr. Golden has asked that is, is definitely worth better, better understanding. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Um, I've got a, a specific point for uh, Angus Robertson. Um, as you'll be aware, one of the organisations facing a funding reduction is the Cultural and Business Fund Scotland, who's facing a 33% cut in funding for 22-23. And this is an organisation that makes uh, funding available to cultural sector organisations, and it's matched by business. So therefore the cut is a double whammy for the cultural sector. And I just wondered if the Cabinet Secretary could explain the rationale behind uh, that uh, funding cut. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is something that my, my colleague Neil Gray has be, been dealing with, and there's some internal communication uh, that is circulating uh, around that. Probably be, probably would make more sense for me to write, mm. probably to the whole committee, because I'm sure that Mr. Golden's not the only person on the committee to, to um, want to understand uh, the background to all of this. But just make the general point that you know, we are going to, over the, next, um, over the next years, we are going to see funding constraints impacting organisations that do good work. Mm. Uh, would I wish it to be so? Um, no, I'd far rather that we did not have the constrained circumstances uh, that we have. And, you know, underlining this point as we come towards the end of the evidence session, it's pr probably important to, to make this point. We are, as government, having to live within our means. This government does not have the normal levers at its disposal that other governments do, i.e. the ability to borrow. Um, would I wish for us to be able to maintain our spending commitments um, as had been envisaged um, in, in, in less constrained times? Absolutely. Will issues come along where people quite rightly want to know, well, is this the appropriate decision to be made? Yeah, that's a perfectly, that's a per perfectly legitimate approach to take. But I'm just, I'm just acknowledging the fact that there are difficult decisions that are going to have to be made. And I think one of the challenges but opportunities that we're going to have to be as, as good as we can be in government is if there's one traditional uh, funding line that has supported you know, a good organisation and, and Morris Golden has, has highlighted one of them is are we making sure of other parallel funding streams that may be able to bridge the gap? Now, I'm not saying that that's the case necessarily with this specific case, but we need to make sure we're getting maximum value out of the resources that we have to maintain and support the organisations that are operating out there. But on the specific case, I, I commit to write back to the th through you, convener, so that Morris Golden and, and, um, and colleagues can have better insight of that. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary. Final question, Convener. Okay, and I, I was just going to say, I, I think that's very reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the, the expected review, which we're on today, doesn't go into the detail of um, Mr. Golden's question, so we'll look forward to getting that response, Mr. Golden. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, we've focused, quite rightly, I think, on in this evidence session on how cultural organisations can continue to do what they're already doing, but clearly, business as usual isn't acceptable in terms of achieving net zero mm. and 
Therefore, despite the climate of a reduction in expenditure, there is also a requirement for our cultural organisations to invest in energy efficiency measures, which is going to be extremely challenging. Yep. And I just wonder, both in terms of assessment of that expenditure for cultural organisations, which the Scottish Government could assist with through the, directly or through their agencies, yep. or, or whether there is even a consideration for exemptions for certain uh, buildings or indeed organisations, but clearly then that needs to be squared off as a whole with meeting our wider net zero targets. So I just wondered your, your thoughts on that, Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> well, it kind of goes back to the historic environment Scotland questions that Sarah Boyack was, was posing earlier in the session. It's, you know, it's much easier to retrofit a relatively recent building um, to uh, reduce its, uh, its carbon emissions. It's very, very difficult to do that the older a building gets. Um, and so, yes, there are, there are a range, there's a sliding scale of, of challenge in, in all of that. Are there different ways that, or different allowances that should be given for that reality? Um, I, I would we want to be better advised about how it is that, that we're doing that in the first place. But you know, I would observe, and this is a conversation that I was having again yesterday, is that a lot of organisations that have, have begun down the path of trying to make the necessary changes that we're all going to have to do, we, we, we've all kind of started with the lowest hanging fruit. Mm. And I think there is a general understanding that the closer we get to the more testing targets that we have, um, we're going to have to make you know, more difficult decisions as we go along. And I, I think that, that fits in part with the appeal that Kate Forbes was making for uh, us trying to protect a space to have a mature debate about how is it that we do that. Because if all, all we do is uh, kind of um, retreat into our own ideological trenches around uh, things and, and do not allow ourselves to, to think in new ways, in all directions, we're, we're probably not going to be able to answer some of these really, really big questions. And so I'm, I'm not sure that I have the answer to hand for the specific question that, that Morris Golden has just asked about, um, about this. But I acknowledge the fact that, you know, specifically on the question of buildings and older buildings, some of them are going to be next to impossible to, um, to, to upgrade um, to the, the latest stage of um, uh, environmental standards um, and many of those, most of those that are, um, are being built and have recently built, been built are. So how does one account for that difference is again something that I'm, I'm content to have a look at. Thank you Cabinet Secretary. Thank Back you. to you. Mr Cameron. Thank you. Can I um, turn to the, the vexed question of spending on the independence referendum? Um, I don't think this is e either the correct time or forum to talk about the rights and wrongs of that, and I don't expect we'll agree on it. But can I ask you, just as a matter of fact, do you think a referendum will happen by the end of 2023? Can I ask Kate Forbes first? Um, that is the intention, and certainly that is what we're working towards. Cabinet Secretary? Uh, yes, and sorry to take issue, I'm, I'm not sure it is a vexed question. Um, we, we can differ, of course, as we do, um, honourably, uh, on how we would vote in such a, such a referendum. But I would hope as Democrats, all of us believe in having democratic votes. And when governments are returned in elections on a platform for votes to be held, that we all as Democrats should agree that that's what should happen. Yes, there's a cost that is associated with a referenda. There's costs that uh, are associated with Scottish Parliament elections, with UK Parliament elections. And it's, it's somebody reasonably suggesting that having Scottish parliamentary elections is a vexed question. I hope not. Are UK parliamentary elections is a vexed question? Of course it's not. These are democratic votes, and as a Democrat, um, I respect the results of the Scottish Parliament elections last year that elected a majority of parliamentarians to this parliament. The people voted for this, that there should be a vote, and a vote there should be, and the government has set out its timetable. I mean, I would suggest gently to Mr Cameron that uh, it would be helpful uh, if his UK government colleagues were um, uh, not just as amenable, but also as respectful of democratic uh, election outcomes in Scotland as former Prime Minister David Cameron was. That would be helpful. 
Um, because it's not a vexed question, the decision's been made, a referendum uh, has been asked for by the electorate, and that's what should happen. Uh, on the back of that, th there is a question as to the timetable. Uh, we know that uh, we, we await a, a referendum bill. We know that has to be consulted upon. Legislation takes time, and there is the potential uh, for litigation. And it is possible that either the timetable will slip or a referendum won't happen. And if that transpires, will you redeploy the funding of £20 million within the culture portfolio, given the very uh, significant challenges, severe challenges that, that that portfolio faces? Well, Mr Cameron left out the other option, of course, which is that a UK government respects the result of the Scottish Parliament election and that Prime Minister Boris Johnson acts in exactly the same way as his predecessor David Cameron uh, acts. So I'm, um, Scottish politics, is, as this Mr Cameron on this committee knows, is full of UK government saying no, 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 yes. And I would uh, invite him to work with me. Uh, to persuade uh, the UK government to, to live up to their uh, democratic undertakings. After all, they're particularly keen on going around the world saying that the, the UK is a democratic country upholding the highest standards of human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And it would be really nice if they did it in this case as well. Will you, will you redeploy the funding, Cabinet? We're going to have a referendum. Aren't we? I don't think we're going to make we? much more from that this morning. Um, I, I don't see any other... Oh, Mr McMillan's beg your pardon. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. And uh, just for the record, uh, I don't have any relevant interests to declare uh, in this committee. Okay. So just it's one uh, question uh, for both uh, Cabinet Secretaries. Um, certainly the mid-term... The uh, financial strategy uh, was really quite uh, stark, I'm sure, for anyone who read it regarding the, the population uh, demographic of Scotland. Uh, and it's not a, a new issue, as we know. It's also something that's been around for quite some time. And also by mid-2043, the, the projected 22.9% of the population will be of pensionable age, as compared to 19% when it was in mid-2018. Uh, and obviously we've had uh, Brexit and uh, the, the severe implications uh, of that affecting Scotland, with, uh, particularly with uh, migration and uh, obviously people going back home. So, uh, just the question is really just regarding any uh, has there been any update or any progress made with discussions with the UK government uh, on helping inward migration to Scotland to actually help deal with the, with that uh, really important issue, uh, certainly which clearly has an impact upon Scotland's economy. Forgive me, convener, we, we could do a whole session on this. Um, as, as part of my broad, broad range of um, portfolio responsibilities, I, I chair the, the Scottish Government's Population Task Force, and I acknowledge Mr McMillan will, will have a particular interest in this, given that uh, the population statistics for Inverclyde in particular are, are of great concern um, uh, for elected members there. Um, and... So, um, I can, I'll answer the question in a number of ways. Firstly, the Scottish Government is very seized of this, um, as are, and understandably so, especially local government uh, leaders in, in authorities that have, have suffered historic population decline. I think traditionally we in Scotland would have looked towards the northwest of the country, looking at the Highlands and Islands as areas where there have been particular population decline challenges in the past, but we're now seeing that in other parts of the country, not least in, in Inverclyde. Observation one. Observation two, we are heading towards population decline in Scotland as a whole. And this is a huge challenge. Um, and it is frankly totally unnecessary. Um, it is sadly in significant part um, because of UK government policy and the restrictions that Brexit has foisted on us, uh, the type of Brexit, which has ended the free movement of people, um, that is the biggest single contributor to us facing population decline. This is something that could be changed by government policy. And I think that goes to the heart of Mr Macmillan's uh, question. Our views are very well known. They are very well understood in Whitehall and Westminster, and they are totally ignored. Um, the UK government uh, has shown no willingness thus far uh, to be imaginative about different approaches, different approaches to immigration policy, different approaches to taxation policy. Um, if we look at the uh, approach that, that we favoured in terms of dealing with refugees for Ukraine, which is not the same thing as immigration, um, but it is about giving people 
uh, a place that they can uh, live and stay. And as we know, often is the case with people in those circumstances, they then make a, a life decision to stay in, in the longer term. And we have a UK government that's pursuing um, a, a refugee crisis as an immigration issue. So on all of these levels, the, the, the UK is taking the wrong approach. I mean, the simple, the simple um, solution to this, of course, is, is that Scotland's parliament and government should be in charge of immigration and should make better decisions that makes uh, Scotland uh, attractive for people to come and live and work and study. We're doing what we can. We're setting up um, a, a migration advisory service. We are doing everything that we can to join government up. Um, uh, national and local to work out what it is that we can uh, do. Um, we have international marketing campaigns, we have uh, policy ideas that we're trying to um, uh, better understand. We are working with other countries. Um, something I've spoken with um, uh, uh, Spanish colleagues, for example, uh, not long ago, because it is, it's a challenge that's also been felt in parts of Spain, and there are lessons that can be learned from other countries uh, perhaps primarily Norway, because of what they've been able to do to support population numbers in, um, in, in the west and, and northwest of, of that country. So there's a lot in the question, and there's a lot more that could be answered. And you know, I think it would be worthy of, of an entire session, frankly. And I'm, I'm keen to keep up my attendance rate at this committee convener, because <laughs> it's been pretty good thus far. But I'm, I'm not wanting to slip down the batting average uh, now that I'm having other colleagues from government attending with me. So um, if, if we're wanting to have an exchange about where things are, with because I really think it is an issue of such importance, um, because it, it, it will bring with it very damaging consequences. Um, uh, economically and, and socially, having a population decline in Scotland. Thank you. Um, I think that does exhaust questions this morning. Can I thank both Cabinet Secretaries and your officials for your attendance at committee this morning? I'm going to suspend for five minutes while we change over witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, we are now moving to our third agenda item, which is intergovernmental relations. It's our third session in a series of meetings focused on post-EU constitutional issues. And this morning we are joined by Dr Paul Anderson, Senior Lecturer in International Relations and Politics from Liverpool John Moores University, Dr Corrie Brown-Swan, Lecturer in Comparative Politics at Queen's University Belfast, and Jess Sargent, Senior Researcher at the Institute of Government, and a warm welcome to you this morning. We are also joined this morning by the Committee's Advisor, Professor Michael Keating, Emeritus Professor of Politics at the University of Aber Aberdeen, who may contribute during the course of the meeting as well. Um, we are four main themes to explore this morning, and we have just about an hour or so from the panel, so um, if we could be concise with questions and answers, that would be really helpful. Um, if I could start off by asking about um, this, some of the work the committee has been doing regarding um, the IGR mechanisms following the review by the UK and devolved governments. And there has been a lot of evidence that we received that um, in terms of UK internal market and common frameworks, that um, it has done very little to improve transparency of that process. And that's also been sh uh, a comment that's been shared by other devolved um, parliaments in this area and, and, and sort of equal committees in, in other areas. And it's really to just say um, what your view is on this and um, in a situation where, where the UK Parliament is perhaps seen as paramount in a hierarchy, um, uh, that um, how, how, as a Scottish Parliament, we can push for more visibility of what is happening at intergovernmental relations at that level. Uh, and I, I, I'll go to you in, in turn. I can see Jess smiling at me, so I'm going to go to <laughs> Jess Sargent first, please. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So there were some kind of specific uh, measures in the review to try and improve transparency, um, including this uh, annual and quarterly reports um, of the whole of the um, intergovernmental relations. Um, that's intended to be published by the Secretariat. We've seen a couple of those reports so far. Um, I was perhaps a little disappointed that they seem to be quite UK government branded. Um, they had the kind of logo of the department for levelling up on them, the foreword by Michael Gove. Now, I don't know if that is just because the IGR secretariat hasn't been set up yet and they will move to a more kind of jointly published format. Um, but I think it would be nice to see that kind of as, as an agreed measure. Um, in terms of some of the communiques that we see come out of various IGR meetings and now we have not only um, the uh, kind of the top level forum, the kind of the middle level forum, um, the um, interministerial um, steering committee and then the interministerial um, the interministerial groups, um, they all produce communiques. I think they're incredibly variable with the level of detail that they have. Actually, we've seen some um, useful ones. So, for example, um, in the kind of EFRA quadrilateral meeting, the EFRA IMG, so that's the meeting of all the environmental ministers, um, that, that's actually quite helpful. That was where that we saw um, that the four governments had agreed um, an exclusion to the UK Internal Market Act for single reusable plastics. That's really useful information. Um, but in other areas, we still see a kind of it was we discussed X, Y, and Z, and no actual um, substance of, of what went on. And I think there is a question as to what the, the main barrier to that is. I think um, uh, secrecy and the need to, well, not necessarily secrecy, but confidentiality is one of the reasons why we don't see some of that information. I think actually perhaps an underrated reason is that any communique has to be agreed before it can be published. And I think sometimes there is a risk that um, the people get bogged down in trying to uh, argue about the, the particular wording of, of various communiques, which just means that they end up with less detail. So I think that is actually also a barrier. Um, and I think that is the responsibility of, of all four governments. I think they all have a tendency to object to particular wording, which makes it more difficult to agree these kind of communiques. But I think the EFRA example shows that we could get to a position where there is more information published um, if the four governments cooperate. So I think it's a very mixed picture um, in terms of the amount of transparency of the various kind of intergovernmental meetings, but hopefully they'll be moving towards a position in which more information rather than less is published. Thank you. Um, Dr Anderson, do you want to come? Sure, no problem. Um, I think the first thing to say is there's recognition in these new arrangements that transparency is an important issue, and I think uh, the new arrangements do to some extent address 
um, some of the main critiques that were levelled at the previous joint ministerial structures where transparency is an issue. And, and I think another important thing to say is intergovernmental relations across you know, all systems uh, throughout different countries are inherently opaque anyway. They are, um, as Jess was pointing out, for good reasons, for confidentiality. Um, you can't always reach agreement. And of course, you know, meetings do take place behind closed doors. At times, so there is an element there of a need to maintain confidentiality and transparency, and therefore becomes more difficult. Um, where these new arrangements may signal a change, and they do signal a change in this direction, at least on paper, is a commitment on the part of the different governments to uh, engage more uh, with publishing information, um, particularly engaging more with Parliament in terms of uh, submitting reports. And there, you know, there's going to be. Um, onus on particular committees within parliaments uh, to effectively scrutinise what's coming out of these um, committees. I think, uh, as Jess was saying, detail is important, and, and from what I've seen so far, uh, the detail is not what I would expect from these new structures, given what it says on paper. The detail is still, um, and again, it could be teething problems or, or trying to get into a rhythm of what information we should um, be teasing out uh, of these things. Um, but I think that the commitment to, to increase transparency is important, and I think here the, the independent secretariat plays an important role, because one of the main critiques of the previous structures is that, you know, it's not only that there wasn't any transparency, but information wasn't shared uh, in a timely manner. But even post uh, meetings, information was scarce. Um, you know, there is no, for example, uh, place where you can go to get all this information. Different governments publish it in different places. Um, so I think there is uh, a commitment to transparency. I think the proof will be in the pudding whether or not the governments continue to, to commit um, to, to publishing things in a timely manner and sharing that information um, that has been agreed to, to go forward to uh, the public, but also to parliamentary committees. Okay. Yeah, I think that centralization or, or support for, for a clearinghouse or, or central spot for these details is really important. And it's, it's, we see mechanisms, we see processes um, for this elsewhere. Um, because it was, Jess mentioned the, the exclusion to the Internal Market Act on single-use plastics. And it took quite a long time after that was agreed for that communique to come out. Um, so, so, I do think that Paul is right, that there's something around teething, that this is a new process. You need to have this engagement. You need to have this commitment. You have good faith efforts here. And it will hopefully work itself over, out, out over time where you see kind of the timely publication of communi communiques and reports. I'm less convinced by, by the annual reports or the importance of the annual reports. I mean, it's helpful to have everything consolidated together. But in terms of, of your function, your scrutiny function as a committee, it's, it's quite difficult to, to scrutinize something, to engage with something um, 12 months after the fact. Um, you have a lot on, the agendas are quite full, and so that scrutiny um, can be, become more difficult if it's only released annually. Thank you. Dr. Allen? Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, just briefly, um, uh, please don't take this question as unduly loaded or unduly cynical. However, uh, it relates to some of the things we've been looking at in this committee. I mean, just looking at the context of this, um, is any dispute mechanism that's designed to fix these problems um, unduly hampered um, if, uh, if the UK can fall back on residual power simply to legislate in devolved areas to solve the problem that it sees? And I don't expect you to solve that problem, but um, given that there has been this debate about the circumstances in which that can and should be done and the the debate about what constitutes normal circumstances. Um, how does that context impinge on this whole discussion that you've been looking at? I, I think um, the issues around Sewell create um, or have created a sort of atmosphere or interaction between the governments undergirded by mistrust. Um, and so I think that the, the movement in the, in the new arrangements towards dispute resolution um, merit special sort of, um, or, 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 or are good in terms of recognising that there is a problem, that the UK government shouldn't be, you know, judge, jury and executioner in these uh, arrangements, that the independent secretariat should play an important role. And I think that does significantly improve um, <clears throat> how disputes should be handled. Um, the issue there, of course, is whether or not the devolved governments um, believe that's going to necessarily um, uh, 
lead to you know more effective relations or, or a dispute mechanism that they will have faith in. Um, I think um, the UK government uh, naturally um, deals with devolution hierarchically. Um, there is a unitary mindset in Westminster and Whitehall that um, still exists uh, today. Um, so on paper, there's at least a move to say we're, we're going to move away from this um, slightly, but still that sort of unitary mindset persists, um, notwithstanding two decades uh, of devolution. And, and that's always going to be um, an issue. But I think here the, the important thing, it comes back to trust. Um, so the governments have agreed to, to move forward in these term, in terms of intergovernmental relations. Um, as Corey is saying, they should enter into these negotiations in, in good faith. And I think the important thing to, to point out as well is the UK is not un, the UK is unique in terms of Sewell and um, the UK government still being able to legislate. Um, but politics is um, uh, not so harmonious business in many multi-level states. Um, the UK, of course, is unique in that there's four separate. Um, governments with four separate parties, which makes intergovernmental relations complicated, but not impossible. It happens elsewhere. Um, the, the difference is you need to enter into these negotiations with a willingness to compromise, um, to, to work out problems. Uh, and at times that's not, or, or that certainly in recent years, particularly since Brexit with legislation, hasn't been the case, uh, particularly on the part of the UK government, um, where I think the onus here is to... to um, sort of set the scene or, or set the, the benchmarks a bit uh, higher than it has been doing uh, in the past. So I think dispute resolution, it's not impossible to resolve these um, disputes. There are, of course, issues still around finance, uh, the financial disputes, which are the most important ones as far as devolved governments, I think, are concerned and, and the most frequent. Um, but I think there is a step in the right direction. Um, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating, whether or not it, it works. Um, so I do, I just to come back to Paul's point around around trust. I think what we've seen over over the last twenty years of, of devolution is is a, a disuse in intergovernmental processes, and it's hard to trust people that you don't know, that you don't see, that there's a contentious partisan dynamic at play, and that's that's again not unique to the United Kingdom, um, but perhaps a more more formal, more routine system of intergovernmental relations in which people are meeting each other, people are building those relationships, learning how to trust each other, um, I think is a, is a positive step forward. Can that overcome the inherent in power imbalances in the UK? No, it, it can't. It can't. It can't fix that system. Um, but it can hopefully um, allow for more productive um, working relationships. And every time you do see an agreement, every time you do see positive negotiation and, and progress um, is, is a positive step like that. It can build over time. Ms. Sargent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with Paul that I do think the dispute um, resolution mechanism is an improvement on, on what was there before. I mean, I think the problem you speak to is a fundamental um, problem of the UK constitution, I suppose, um, in that uh, there aren't kind of uh, strict rules. It's, you know, parliamentary sovereignty, ultimately, a, a government with a majority in Westminster is able to uh, to change legislation, which can alter the constitution. And um, I think traditionally the UK constitution has operated quite well as a political constitution on the assumption that all actors will um, kind of act act rationally. I think one of the reasons why the Sewell Convention has actually worked so well previously to the most recent Brexit period is because that threat of consent being withheld was enough to extract concessions mm -hmm. um, when the UK government and the devolved administrations were in discussions. Now, it, it does appear that that's, that that's broken down. Um, exactly what, what you do about that, I guess there's kind of two options. One is uh, to restore that kind of traditional sense of political constitutionalism to ensure that there are kind of those negotiations and those concessions and that give and take that makes the constitution function. But inevitably, some people are also thinking about uh, the possibility of a kind of a different system in which rights are more entrenched. I mean, that would require fundamentally a, a, some kind of codified constitution, because even if you codify elements of the devolution arrangements, like in the Sewell Convention, you know, that can still be overruled by, by parliamentary majorities. So that's obviously something that people are looking at now, including mm. in the Welsh Government and potentially also the Labour Party. But obviously that would be quite a radical change. Um, and so there's a question whether there is the political will to overhaul the whole of the UK's constitutional system.
And, and very briefly, just on the point you've just made, uh, Ms Sargent, I, I suppose, again, a loaded question, but um, you, you've pointed to the, the history where, in the past, people would not want to have been seen at the UK level um, not to care uh, about the view of devolved legislatures. But how do you cope with a situation where they don't? I think it's a, it's a very difficult one um, because I don't think there are any easy answers because what it requires is a change in kind of culture and approach and that's very difficult to uh, really encourage anyone to do other than by, you know, just saying that the, <laughs> that's the way to approach it. You know, there's, there's no mechanisms you can use to force people to think that way. I do think the Brexit process did create particular dynamics which lent itself to this slightly adversarial approach, well, I say slightly, actually quite adversarial approach between the UK government and the devolved administrations and the fact that there was a referendum also added a kind of extra complication into the picture there. I think there is an opportunity now to return to more normal working. So I would hope that going forward, perhaps some of the, the the disputes that we saw over Sewell over the Brexit period might be avoided in future and we could return to this system where there are these behind the scenes negotiations, there's discussion <clears throat> on legislation. But yeah, I, there's no easy answer to how you encourage people. And I think, you know, all, all of the um, governments at this point as well, because I think um, there is also a risk that um, at times uh, there's an incentive for the devolved administrations to, or the devolved governments to ob object because politically that's also quite helpful for them. So I think all sides need to come back together and, and try and fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr Cameron? Uh, sorry, did anyone else want to comment? No, fine. Sorry. Uh, <coughs> sorry, Donald. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, can I address the question of international comparators, which um, uh, a number of you, I think all of you um, have spoken about or written about? Um, and from the European systems, whether it's a sort of federal or quasi-federal um, system, to through to Australia, India, and Canada. Um, can I just ask each of you for your observations on those, uh, and whether you see any of those providing a model for Scotland um, in relation to IGR going forward? And if I could start with Dr. Corey Brownswan. Great. Yes. Um, so we have done quite a, quite a significant amount of comparative work looking at looking at those formal federations, but also quasi quasi federations. I think I was I was before your colleagues in 2015 talking about scrutiny and transparency in, in intergovernmental relations, and someone asked me, "Well, what's the model? What's is there a system where it works well, where intergovernmental relations works well?" I. I honestly, I think intergovernmental relations is always difficult because there's disputes over power, there's disputes over money, there's, there's partisan disputes. So it's always very difficult. But we do see models where you have a more cooperative system, where you have buy-in, where you have faith uh, that, that people are working together. Um, I think what we see when we look to Canada, we see quite significant formalization of the system of intergovernmental relations supported by a secretariat, um, which brings people together on a regular basis. There's this formal mechanism for dispute resolution. When you look to the, the management of the internal markets, the provinces feel that they have an important voice there. Um, so we do see examples of, of where this works. In Spain, you have sectoral conferences. Um, it's, it's a case where intergovernmental relations, because of the dispute over Catalonia, is quite difficult. So at the executive level, things are very difficult, but you have sectoral conferences that meet regularly, that bring together ministers and civil servants regularly together outside of the domain of the constitutional debate. Um, so I think when we look towards those models, you... We see cases, we see states where you have similar constitutional d dynamics to that of the UK, contentious debates over the constitutional future of each. Um, but at a, at a sectoral level, at, at a ministerial level, that can, some of that can be put aside to, to cooperate on key issues, co to cooperate on the economy, to cooperate on COVID response, um, things like that. Um, so I do think there's there's not a perfect model, there's not, there's not a blueprint for the Scotland and the rest of the UK, um, but we can look towards some of those other states where things work better um, to, to see if, if we can borrow something from there. And Jess Sargent, please. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll keep it brief because I know uh, Paul and Corey have done a lot more kind of detailed research into various international examples. And my point is perhaps less helpful than, than what they're going to say. Um, but I think I just wanted to point out the kind of unusual nature of the UK constitution. And I think one of the barriers to adopting some systems that are used elsewhere, and that's the kind of dual role of the UK government as the government of the UK and the government of England, which makes it, it very difficult for them the UK government to kind of act um, in, a, in a way that makes decisions for the whole of the UK in a kind of neutral basis, but also to act as a kind of convener or um, the kind of central part um, of, of the other member states because of this kind of complicated dual role. So I think just a kind of note of caution of borrowing too many examples from other places, um, it's not, as I say, not necessarily helpful, <laughs> but I think there are things that make it more difficult to implement those types of systems. Um, I think that's a point that you, Dr Anderson, you've made as well, isn't it? Um, sure. Yeah, and I think, I mean, echoing exactly what Corey said, there is no perfect model of intergovernmental relations. These uh, relations are conditioned by political context, they're conditioned by uh, political culture, um, and you can have the most perfect structures. It does not mean intergovernmental relations uh, are going to work and that the interaction is going to be there. Um, so, you know, picking up on what Corey's saying around Canada, there are, and I think you can see this clearly in the new arrangements. Um, these lessons have been taken from elsewhere because the sectorial conferences in Spain, which do work well, notwithstanding. Um, inter-regional issues, particularly around Catalonia and secessionism. Um, sectorial conferences happen, uh, agreements are made. Um, there's clear commitment on behalf of most governments. I think potentially where the UK um, it finds it more difficult is we're talking about um, three devolved um, governments and a UK government, as Jess was saying, with, with a double role. Uh, in Canada, we're, we have 10 provinces. In Spain, we have 17 autonomous communities. Um, I think the, the big... Uh, difference between where intergovernmental relations work really well is the federal way of thinking. Um, so, you know, Switzerland, uh, Canada, uh, Germany, where the second chamber um, is uh, a federally representative chamber, where there's a culture of compromise and cooperation built into these arrangements. Um, the UK government, or, or the UK itself, is probably never going to become a fully fledged self identified federation. Um, but certainly over the last two decades, it's moving in that direction. But lessons there can be learned in terms of how political culture can inform uh, these relations. And I think that's potentially sometimes more important than having the perfect structures. And I think the other thing to, to not forget is intergovernmental relations uh, are also effective when they happen informally. Um, so I found this in my research as well, speaking with ministers in this parliament and elsewhere to say, well, you know, we go to these meetings and it can be contentious and difficult and not harmonious, um, but I can phone the minister in Westminster because I know who they are. Um, I've got their mobile number. We deal with things informally or, and civil servants play an important role here as well. So um, formal structures are, are good. They're a step in the right direction. They're needed. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have the most effective relations. And that's the case in all multi-level systems. Thank you. Just one final question um, uh, about the internal markets comparators, because that's something that I think is at the foremost uh, forefront of our mind. Um, and has been recently. And I was very struck by something that um, Dr. Corey Brown wrote in, in her submission, which was about the comparison between Australia and Canada. Um, whether, I think, and I quote, there are two modes of thinking about the internal market in these two states. In Australia, there is comparatively minimal state level resistance to processes of harmonization, whilst in Canada, barriers to trade are to a degree considered an acceptable cost to maintain provincial autonomy. Do you, do you want to develop that at all? Sure, sure. So that's um, a concurrent work looking at and, and really trying to build, find lessons for the UK internal market on how these very developed federations, which, which also have a Westminster system, or Westminster style system, um, manage the internal market. In, in Australia, we see, we see an instance where the federal government, the Commonwealth, has, there's a significant power imbalance. Um, they have all the money. The vertical fiscal imbalance is, is so extreme in Australia um, that often the states go, go along with things because they, the, the centre has the purse strings. Um, so it's very different from Scotland. Um, it's also a political culture aspect as well, where there's a sense, and, and this is something I've continually found in interviews in Australia, 
Well, they said, well, we need to tidy up the Federation. It doesn't make sense to have this policy divergence. We need, we need to all, we need to have it the same throughout. There's not a whole lot of tolerance for policy divergence. In Canada, it's very different, especially in, in provinces with, with a distinctive political identity, a distinctive national identity. There's a sense that, yes, you're going to, we are going to accept some barriers to the internal market um, in comparison to other federal federal states, the Canadian internal market is a very fragmented one, um, but that's accepted because provincial autonomy is very important. So the, the ability of the federal government to intervene, to, to harmonize, or to um, reduce barriers to trade is much more limited. And when we saw the Canadian Free Trade Agreement to reduce barriers to trade, that was brought about at the impetus of the provinces themselves. They agreed to kind of a general baseline and then brought the federal government in um, to that agreement. It's a bit up in the air whether that's worked, um, but you have very clear dispute resolution processes. You have processes for reconciliation to reduce barriers to trade, to agree things between the provinces. Um, so you have very formalized structures. Um, with a quite fragmented internal market, but that's politically, culturally, that's 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 accepted. That's that's considered to be a worthwhile compromise. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ruskell. Yeah, I, I was struck by what you were saying about um, sectoral conferences, and I, and I note that Belgium, I think, has ministerial conferences. I'm, I'm quite interested in that kind of wider conversation, I mean, not, not to dilute the role of politicians and, and ministers, but, you know, it seems that a lot of the kind of legislation that we deal with is statutory instruments are very technical. So it is perhaps a discussion more between government agencies with stakeholders and the agreements that then follow that, you know, legislation then gets brought forward um, before it gets near politicians. So can you say a little bit more about how those that kind of wider approach works, that wider conversation where politicians are in the mix, but it, it's actually, you know, civil servants and agencies and others that are, that are, that are part of that, and, and whether, whether we have that in, in the UK and across these islands or, or not. Yeah. Jess, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah, I think there is actually a lot of working that goes on at official and um, public body level um, that's kind of on a four-nation basis. Um, if we think it's some of the areas covered by common frameworks, there's the Food Standards Agency that works very closely with Food Standards Scotland. You've got um, the HSE, which is responsible for a lot of areas of kind of chemical regulation. And actually speaking to a lot of these regulators, they almost uh, don't really think that... Um, the, the, the potential regu regulatory divergence is that much of a problem because they say, you know, we, we make recommendations to ministers. In some cases, they do have regulation making powers and to ministers in all four nations on the basis of, of the evidence. And the evidence in each part of the UK is actually very similar. Um, although obviously there are um, different circumstances in, in each part of the UK generally, um, it's not like there are kind of wildly different economies or uh, different kind of circumstances that would ne um, necessitate different food standards or, or those sorts of things. So um, I think one of the interesting things is that a lot of the bodies that were established are, were established kind of pre-devolution, so they weren't necessarily set up to serve for governments and actually different regulators take very different approaches to this. Some of them do have kind of formal representation from the four um, nations on their boards. Some of them have what's known as service level agreements, which are much more informal. So for example, the HSE has that just kind of, they agree with the Scottish government that they will advise on this little bit rather than kind of looking at the whole picture. So I think there is a question of particularly post Brexit when some of these functions are returning to the UK from the EU, whether um, we need to think a little bit more about how that kind of system works generally um, and thinking also about uh, organisations like uh, the Competition and Markets Authority, which will now have responsibility for subsidy control across the whole of the UK, and also houses the Office for the Internal Market, which will be advising on um, a lot of instances of regulatory divergence, um, whether more needs to be done to ensure that that's a kind of four-nation basis. But actually, I think there is a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and works quite well, and perhaps that's why we hear about it a bit less, because it is working well kind of behind the scenes. Um, but perhaps... Yeah, it's a bit more kind of piecemeal approach than there might be in, in, in other countries. <laughs> and um, Corrie, do you want to talk a bit more about the sectoral sure. conferences? I'm aware that various sectors were very much involved with the, the CETA trade deal, including our own Scotch Whiskey Association, I think, that managed to 
carve some concessions out of it. Who, who knew? But <laughs> yes, definitely. So we have the um, when we look to to other federal states, um, we we have sectoral conferences in, in Spain, in Belgium, and Canada, um, which are are often driven by ministerial priorities, by priorities that the governments um, set out on an annual basis, on, on perhaps a biannual basis, um, but largely driven by civil servants with input from civil society, with industry associations. Um, so I think in, in Spain, there's, there's upwards of 20 um, that meet throughout the year. Some of them meet very frequently because it's something that you need to bring people together on to coordinate or ahead of an agreement. You see a greater degree, a greater intensity of coordination there. Um, some meet less frequently because there's not kind of a need for cooperation. And the Minister for sport and Sports don't need to really cooperate that much um, while the Ministers for the Economy do. Um, so you see sectoral level uh, intergovernmental relations, which often works quite well, um, both for the formation of agreements on certain areas and um, cooperation agreements, whether those are bilateral or, or multilateral agreements, um, but also just for, for information sharing and policy learning. Um, that, those coordinate, that coordination, that, those relationships tend to be quite important. Um, in Spain, they're, they're very formalized, um, so they have official agreements, um, they have decision-making processes, they have processes for voting. Um, there's an emphasis on consensus and a priority to securing consensus, but the, in the event that consensus can't be secured, there's processes for, for decision, formal decision-making. Um, but again, the issue of a of a sing of a government representing multiple entities um, or having um, the kind of dual-hatted role of England isn't present in, in Spain or in, in, in Belgium. Belgium's always complicated um, with their with their regional and, and community mm -hmm. component, but there's a similar process there. Yeah, um, I think the first thing to say is don't underestimate the work of civil servants in keeping intergovernmental relations going. Um, IGR are at times the glue that keeps states together, but they're, they're also the oil that keeps things going. And even throughout, you know, the last five uh, years of, of difficult intergovernmental relations um, in the media and, and very, you know, public um, intergovernmental relations happen behind the scenes because civil servants are there to, to keep these um, issues um, going. I think in terms of bringing in other uh, agencies, it's a common practice across different states. Um, particularly to take advantage and exploit the niche expertise that these agencies have that, that governments potentially don't have, um, you know, with no offence to, to, to politicians um, in the room. Intergovernmental relations is not the top of um, priorities when, when people uh, or come into politics or, or want to be elected, um, I don't think. Um, and so I think here you have to rely on this sort of niche expertise. Not to underestimate, however, that devolved governments have niche expertise. Um, the Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe um, worked very well because the, the devolved governments were able to bring in niche expertise around agriculture and things like this that wasn't necessarily shared um, within the UK government. And I think just picking up on the final point around sectoral conferences, it's intergovernmental relations is, is about interaction, it's about cooperation and collaboration. But as Corey is saying, it's also about opportunities from learning from each other. So it's about sharing information, um, it's about sharing best practice. And we see this in the UK where, where things have been introduced in, in this parliament that have been rolled out elsewhere, you know, in terms of smoking bans and, and things like this. So you can see there is opportunity for policy learning and I think sectorial conferences um, offer a, a, an important lesson there. But where they also work is the horizontal level. That is governments working together without the central government involved. Um, and typically this happens uh, in Spain to uh, present, for all the reasons I mentioned about policy learning and things like this, but also then to coalesce around a particular position to then challenge the central government or go. So as Cody's mentioned around um, the provincial governments in, in Canada, horizontal relations in Canada predate vertical relations with the, the federal government. So it's easier for these governments to come together with a position around you know, trade and then go to the, to the federal um, government. The UK is hampered here because there's only three uh, devolved governments and, and England doesn't have a devolved government, although there's potentially devolved leaders around metro mayors and things like this. Um, but I think sectoral conferences, it's not just about um, facilitating cooperation, which is important. There are other things that can be learned from governments, parliaments, civil servants, and of course, this, the niche expertise of individual 
um, agencies and, and, mm -hmm. and other organisations. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a, a, a quick supplementary um, in terms of the stage where it changes after Brexit and, and, and building these new systems and, and, and working towards them. So uh, Deputy Convener and I attended the PPA as observers in, in Brussels. Um, now at ministerial level, there is a, a, a pre-meet of the ministers and, and, and the UK government to that. But with the delegation made up solely of um, Westminster MPs and House of Lords members, the devolved um, parliaments were all there as observers. Now, there wasn't someone there from the Senate due to the Irish electoral cycle, but it was the Northern Ireland Protocol that absolutely dominated the two days. And um, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm asking, is it a similar situation anywhere where, where, where the parliamentary or the, 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 the federal arrangements, the, 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 where they don't mirror the ministerial levels in the way that the, the you know the PPA doesn't seem to, and the fact that um, the, there's no pre-meet with the UK delegation for us to be able to contribute to or or be involved in um, as devolved nations. So how does that work in other in other areas? Um, I don't know if I'll I'll I'll, I'll try. <laughs> um, I think. Uh, Potentially here, one of the things that needs to be more explored in the UK, uh, which is um, what you've hinted at, is around inter-parliamentary relations. Um, the U they, they have happened in, in the UK, but they've been very ad hoc. Um, and I think here there's uh, exactly, you know, just like what I was saying around sectoral conferences, there's opportunities to bring parliaments together to learn, um, you know, around uh, processes within parliaments, scrutiny of committees, um, sort of sharing best practice and things like this. And I think that um, you have inter-parliamentary relations uh, in other systems. They're normally not as formalised as, as intergovernmental relations, but they do exist. And, and potentially there that can help um, sort of what Corey was saying at the, the beginning, bringing people together, um, building that trust and, and so that you, you sort of work um, together. I think one of the issues around intergovernmental relations and, and lots of systems is the difference between being listened to and being heard. Um, and, and ensuring that, in the case of the UK, the devolved governments have a voice. Um, that's something that was not the case in the devolved, in the joint ministerial structures, with potentially the exception of the Joint Ministerial Committee on Europe, where the devolved governments, um, you know, were there, they could uh, have input in, in pre-meets and, and uh, you know, with certain caveats and limitations. But those structures worked more effectively because the devolved governments were much more involved in them and other structures. So I think, and I think that's the case in, in uh, countries, in other countries, federal countries, including, uh, you know, quasi-federal like Spain, where still central government tends to have a key role at the sort of apex of intergovernmental structures. Um, it's not a great thing, it's not a good idea um, to have this centralised um, control. It's obvious um, why it exists, but it's, that, that sort of taints how relations um, can happen. But I don't think here the UK is necessarily um, an outlier in how, in bringing governments together. Um, but I do think it comes back to this building trust uh, relations uh, and opportunities to sort of share those things in, not necessarily in pre-meets, but at least um, having uh, a discussion where, where governments feel they're not just saying, or, or grandstanding, or, or it's an interpretation of grandstanding, actually what they're saying is being listened to, um, being actioned or being critiqued, and then uh, policy formulated or, or agreements formulated from this. Um, but it's not an easy, it's not a linear process, and it isn't like that in any intergovernmental relations structure in other countries. I guess the pre-meet, well, certainly for myself, I don't have my different opinion, but the pre-meet is the key thing for us and that, that we don't have an opportunity to feed into that delegation pre-meet. Um, I'm going to move to questions from Sarah Boyack, please. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, can I also thank you for the submissions we've had in advance? It's been able to give us a bit of depth in terms of looking at the alternatives. Um, it's really to follow up um, the questions about interparliamentary work, um, but to kind of broaden that out as well, because one of the issues um, that's raised, and we've just briefly heard from Dr Anderson about the horizontal relationships, um, which are not factored in and they're not formalised, um, and the scope for doing that in the UK to learn from other 
uh, countries. So the horizontal relations being both between the UK government and the devolved governments, but also with local governments, so acknowledging that multi-tier set of relationships. Um, so I was wondering, to kick off, uh, Dr Anderson, do you want to say a bit more about that and where you think we are? Because we've met with PACAC, the um, UK Parliament's uh, constitutional affairs team. We've met with the House of Lords uh, team that are looking at constitutional change. And there does feel like an appetite for change. So it's thinking through what are the priorities to push in terms of both inter-parliamentary and inter-government relations, that you don't miss out that potential radical change that could actually solve some of the challenges? Sure. I think uh, inter-parliamentary inter relations are not are often not, they're not as interesting as intergovernmental relations because you don't necessarily have the um, the tensions that pop up. You know, you're not going to find front page news of a meeting between um, committees within this chamber and, and uh, Westminster. Um, but I think they're important, uh, and I think they're particularly important given that we've had devolution for two decades. Mm -hmm. um, we have parliaments. Um, uh, it, well, in Wales and in Scotland, in the Assembly in Northern Ireland, where lessons can be learned between um, all three, where we see, particularly in Wales at the moment, you know, changes being mooted around electoral systems and how to move forward, sort of coming of age of, you know, after two decades, taking stock and where are we? Um, and, and I think uh, it's a good thing. We've seen, you know, over the last few years, committees in, in this chamber working with committees in Westminster um, that works, and I think it's a good thing that the committee, particularly. Given where we are now in the UK in terms of interdependencies, um, particularly post-Brexit, where we have um, competencies now that are overlapping, um, there needs to be more interaction between governments. But that doesn't mean that committees um, can't work together either in seeking to address issues, in um, coalescing around, for example, a particular issue to, to force government uh, into uh, interacting. So I'm thinking here, um, there seems to be consensus in, in the different parliaments around um, uh, what Jess was saying at the beginning, around the Seoul Convention and perhaps you know, how to um, address these issues. Um, that's certainly the case from uh, committees in the House of Lords, uh, in the House of Commons, in uh, the Welsh uh, Parliament and here as well. So why not bring these different committees together in a forum and, and sort of take a position to try and um, not force change, but encourage debate and, and conversation. Um, local government as well, I think, uh, you know, there there's a contentious issue at the moment around um, the Shared Prosperity Fund and, and what, how money is going to be spent, um, whether or not the devolved governments will be involved in those conversations or, or cut out. Uh, and things like this. And I think there, it's not normal to have the central government and local government necessarily cooperating together. They're having intergovernmental uh, relations, but why not bring local government into some of these conversations to work better with devolved government? You know, um, having local government and devolved governments work together is clearly um, a good thing. Uh, and if the UK government involved in those conversations, then fine, with the caveat, of course, that local government is very different um, elsewhere. And, and just sort of final point, one of the weaknesses of the new arrangements is uh, the elephant in the room, which is England. Mm -hmm. um, the UK government has a double uh, role as the UK government and uh, the, the English government. Um, and uh, here, I think uh, England uh, potentially loses out a bit because you do have nine metro mayors. Um, you have metro mayors with significant policy responsibilities. We've seen during the pandemic that certain mayors um, took on big roles and, and stood up to central government yeah. when they were unhappy. Um, why isn't the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government working potentially with some of these institutions? Um, you know, there's some exciting things happening in Liverpool and Manchester around transport. Um, transport, you know, are there lessons to be learned for, for other parliaments? Could they work together? So I think their horizontal relations could potentially address that imbalance, but that would help the England sort of gain a different voice from the UK government, because of course priorities are very different, but also an opportunity to learn uh, and, and share policy ideas and things like this as well. I think it's really good to get that on the record in terms of um, change that could actually make a big difference. And your, your point about transport, I mean, um, there's also stuff that could be learnt from Glasgow and Strathclyde in terms of the work that's been done on, on transport there too. Um, I was going to ask just a follow-up question um, for Corrie Brown-Swan about that issue about um, different levels and relationships. And you talk very interestingly about Canada, 
and the work that's done that's cross-border and intergovernmental in terms of relationships and agreements. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that because um, it's a way of strengthening the impact um, that we could get and thinking about that linking across to the intergovernmental but focusing on the interparliamentary work. Mm -hmm. um, and would you agree that there's a, a potential role, say, for the Metro mayors to just change the dynamic at the centre? and stop thinking of the centre running things and then acknowledging multi-level parliaments and governments? Yeah, I think I think that bringing in those voices into intergovernmental forums is really important. Um, we see this elsewhere where um, mayors, where, where council, city councils or major urban areas have representation in the sectoral conferences in, in Canada and Spain. And when it impinges on their areas of responsibility, that's often very helpful. Um, I do wonder if, in a formalised system of intergovernmental relations, if, if the Welsh, Scot Scottish and, and Northern Irish executive would would be quite keen on, on being at the same level as a metro mayor. So there's some sensitivities there. Mm -hmm. And that is always perpetually the issue. How do you... Do you, if in a constitutional future of the UK, do you carve up England into a federation? Um, does that, how does that work? And, and no one's, no one's ever come up with a, with a concrete answer there. Um, but I think it is important. The more voices that you have in the room, particularly for that policy learning, for sharing, um, for cooperation and coordination on things, I think the more voices, the better. It makes decision making more complicated. But we know that. The, the forums for intergovernmental relations aren't really, aren't always decision-making forums or aren't forums where they need to have a vote. Um, I think at the parliamentary, interparliamentary level, I think that coordination is, is important. We do see it, you see it less, I think, within federal states, but within, um, within European member states where you have committees scrutinizing European le legislation, particularly on security and defense. Um, so that's perhaps, a, there's some lessons to be gained from there. Um, so I don't know, it feels a little bit silly to say everyone needs to talk more, but everyone does need to talk more because that is how you gain ideas, that's how you cooperate, that's how you build trust. So that when it comes time to take these big decisions, these difficult, these sensitive decisions, you're doing so from a place of trust. And you're always going to have the constitutional elephant in the room. You're always mm -hmm. going to have those, those big party partisan dynamics. Um, but if you can speak to how do we respond to this economic issue? How do we improve transport? How do we improve connectivity? If you if you can speak from a position of trust and pre-existing relationships, that's that's often very helpful. Yeah, because on one level you've got uh, longevity among civil servants mm -hmm. who might be there longer. Ministers do get reshuffled, um, and parliaments change around. But there's a bit more stability in parliaments in terms of committees. Mm -hmm. But you also get the cross-party links. So it's interesting just looking at how you how you make that work going forward. Um, just wondering if, if uh, I think also you made some comments, uh, Corey Brown Swan, about the mem memorandum of understandings. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say a little bit about how you think that's worked? Because it's, it's not that long that we've had them, um, and then we had COVID. So, are there any lessons from the last couple of years about what we need to accelerate to make them work better? Um, I think the MOU so agreed between between this Parliament and the Scottish Government um, to increase transparency, to notify committees when relationships with the with, between governments when and when meetings are taking place. I think that's worked to a degree. Um, it's it's been consistently achieved. It's, it's been consistently. You see the publication of. Um, of those communiques, often they're not very detailed. And coming back to Jess's initial point, I think the more detailed those can be, um, the more helpful they are. And they're helpful for broader transparency, they're helpful for researchers who work on intergovernmental relations. Um, but they give us a sense of what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you need a sense of what's going yeah. on to, to be able to ask the right questions, to figure out who to call for witnesses, to be able to ask, to, to tease out more data there. And I think there is always the question of confidentiality, whether things are sensitive, um, but more detailed communiques, more de detailed outputs, um, I think are, are always helpful. So.
And I don't know if Jess Sargent, do you want to come in on the interparliamentary work and yeah. how you make that work better? Yeah, great. I mean, I think um, I agree with uh, a, a lot that um, Paul and Corey have said. Um, I think actually one of the, the keys to interparliamentary working is through the committee system. So I'm really pleased to hear um, the work that you've been doing. I think what we need to make sure is that it's not just the reserve of people that are explicitly looking at intergovernmental relations and actually that it really feeds through mm -hmm. um, kind of regular policy issues. I mean, we set out some kind of proposals for um, interparliamentary working in our report on the UK internal market. And one of the ideas that I'm quite attracted to is a kind of uh, a chairs forum um, that mirror some of the interministerial groups that will be set up. And this was a model that was used with the chairs of the Europe committees um, when there was still the, the JMC in Europe. And I think that would be really helpful for information sharing um, and particularly flagging potential instances of regulatory divergence. I know that one of the um one of the issues the committee has been looking at is around kind of scrutiny of, of, of common frameworks and regulated divergence and the Scottish Government's response um, to kind of one of the recommendations was that the committee will have the opportunity to scrutinise any kind of piece of legislation that might be part of a common framework and that's certainly true but this committee, this committee won't necessarily have the opportunity to scrutinise um, a piece of legislation that's coming through another parliament and, and vice versa so I think that could actually be a really useful forum to allow people to recognise where uh, there have been, even without waiting for the governments to come and tell them that they've made this agreement and this is happening, um, to, to, yeah, to flag those issues coming down the pipeline to potentially um, make joint reports. Because I think fundamentally the, the best way of influencing intergovernmental um, discussions and decisions is through interparliamentary working. Um, because if there is negotiations in the intergovernmental sector, once they are concluded and then the, 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 the governments present that to their parliaments, they're very unlikely to want to go back and change that because that will mean reopening the, the discussions, re reopening negotiations. Whether is, if there is a specific issue that all the committees or all the parliaments can, can flag as a particular problem that they all commonly feel all their governments need to address, then I think that puts a lot more pressure on them. Um, so there's the potential to actually extract changes, which, you know, scrutiny for scrutiny's sake is is very important, but actually, fundamentally, it's about what impact that, that could have. I think we agree with that. Uh, <laughs> environment and rural issues, economic issues, trade issues, we just can't be experts on that. Mm -hmm. So it's how, how those issues are flagged so that we get that effective cross-parliamentary work. Really yep. important. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Allen, uh, Dr. Allen's going to leave us at the, the moment it's up. Do, uh, you, yes. do you want in quickly? Um, no, I'll have to leave, yeah. I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, uh, Thank you. Um, Mr McMillan, thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, it's, uh, Dr Anderson, that you said something earlier on which uh, I'm sure will actually strike a chord uh, with everyone in the room, and you said that civil servants are the glue uh, that keeps things going when it comes to IGR. Uh, so obviously I think as, as some of the discussions that have taken place thus far, the, the point of the politicians do move on, etc. Um, and um, so this is uh, my third session uh, in this Parliament of uh, talking about IGR, and I was on the Devolution for the Powers Committee uh, way back, so it's uh, a bit of Groundhog Day to say the least. Um, but the, it's kind of, it struck me certainly looking through the, the submissions uh, and uh, also the, the comments from uh, Professor Nicola McEwen, um, when, uh, and I quote, she, she stated that uh, parliamentary committees in every UK legislature uh, have called for greater transparency and greater oversight of IGR, not least in light uh, of its increased importance in the context of both Brexit and COVID. And she goes on to say uh, there is no reference to parliamentary oversight or a requirement to engage the parliaments uh, with regards to this new IGR review. Um, do, you, do, the, do you agree with Professor McEwen or uh, would you have any other thoughts? I'll start with yourself, uh, first of all, Dr uh, uh, Brownswan. Um, I think that's true. I think, I think as we're looking at formalizing, as there's been a process to move forward um, in, in formalizing intergovernmental relations, there needs to be specific opportunities for, for parliamentary scrutiny to take place, for oversight to take place. Um, and in, in other cases, we see, we see committees specifically charged with intergovernmental relations, the, um, the there's a committee within the Quebec National Assembly that has remit for um, intergovernmental relations. <laughs> no 
necessary. I wonder if it's it's better for individuals committees, the environment committee, the health committee to, to engage in the scrutiny functions. Um, but I think that's something, there's an opportunity and, and a need um, for, that, for that scrutiny and oversight to take place um, in, across the UK. Um, so not just here in this parliament, um, but elsewhere. But it, it does seem to be a bit of an oversight to not and perhaps we can understand the motivation behind that, not not telling parliaments how to do how to do their job. Um, so, it, so there's a, there's an element there that it's up to each individual parliament to decide how they want that to exercise that scrutiny function. Um, but it is it is crucially important. I think before you come in, um, uh, Ms. Sargent, I think it's fair to say that population tells us how to do our job all the time anyway. So, so you don't have to be shy about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I certainly think it's important for there to be scrutiny of these intergovernmental discussions. I think one of the challenges is around the appetite of parliamentarians, and I think actually particularly in, in the UK Parliament, um, particularly to scrutinise IGR in the abstract. And although the House of Lords has done a very good job on scrutinising common frameworks, we've seen very little engagement from the Commons because... They don't understand, like a lot of MPs don't think that this technical complex thing which, you know, has some, you know, these little dispute resolution procedures is what they should be spending their time on versus, you know, being with constituents or working on policy issues. And so I think where there is a lot of potential for better scrutiny of IGR is through specific policy issues. And in order for that to take place, I think all the governments need to empower Parliament to, to look at the IGR aspects of various policy proposals. Um, and that could be through including some information about um, the kind of intergovernmental discussions that have taken place within explanatory notes. It could be a discussion of uh, the kind of broader regulatory context. So what other governments are doing as, as part of that, um, the kind of resources that are given to parliamentarians when they're asked to look at legislation or policies or those sorts of things. I think another really great resource could be the Office for the Internal Market, um, which can, at the request of governments, um, look at the implications of a particular policy, um, either before it's in place or after, um, that will rely on, on the governments themselves to uh, trigger to ask for that advice. And I think it's something that um, parliamentarians should be encouraging governments to use so that they have that um, thorough analysis, economic analysis and, and regulatory analysis. So I think rather than perhaps just giving it a role and saying you need to do this, I think actually what governments need to think about and what parliamentarians should be pushing governments to think about is what resources and information they need to be able to not just do that role but do it effectively rather than giving them another thing to kind of think about at their kind of committee meeting I think actually it's how can it be meaningful how can it make changes how can it relate to decisions that are being made or policy that's that's going, being taken forward sure um just sort of briefly on the first point around civil servants I think um not to say civil servants don't do a great job. One of the big issues that I think we have in Whitehall is civil servants do move on pretty quickly. So I think while civil servants in the devolved parliaments understand devolution, that's not always the case in uh, Whitehall. Uh, and that's potentially why we have so many issues around, and I think we saw this very clearly during COVID, misunderstandings about what the devolved parliaments do, because civil servants change and then have to be, you know, um, educated or re-educated on what the devolved parliaments do. So I think they are important, but, you know, perhaps here needs to be a lot more um, education around for civil servants, particularly in Whitehall, about devolved governments and things. On parliamentary oversight, I, I, I certainly agree with, with what Professor McCune has said, and I don't think it's um, unsurprising that there's not work or there's not comments on parliamentary oversight based on what Corrie is saying, but also because the different governments interact with parliaments in, in different ways as well. So here, the onus is on the devolved governments to engage with parliament and to agree um, sort of terms there and how to um, share information or, or to ensure that parliament has um, a, a scrutiny and oversight function. Uh, again, here, why, are, why don't the devolved parliaments come together in a horizontal capacity and discuss how to do that? You know, is there a way that can be learned between the different devolved parliaments and how to do it? Um, and I think here that's where the memorandum of understanding between uh, the parliament and the government is, is a good thing. It's, it's good practice. Um, perhaps it needs to be updated in light of the new arrangements because um, 
I don't think an annual report is, is enough, and as Corrie is saying, it's an annual report um, that's being examined 12 months after relations, so, so potentially moving that to a quarterly function. Um, the only caveat, and I think that's important because then there should be an expectation on ministers engaging in intergovernmental relations that they're going to be held to account by committees, that they should be sharing information, that this is um, important, not in, in a negative way, in, in a sort of positive, you know, come along and engage with us and, and share this information. Where it's important is to find that balance, because too much transparency may lead to um, you know, ministers uh, sending off stock answers uh, in, with regard to, to requests, or you know, if we have to, after every, every intergovernmental meeting, uh, submit a report on, on this, then you know, it's a copy and paste job from the previous report with a few words. Um, so it's trying to find that balance between creating expectations that uh, the intergovernmental relations through governments are being held to account and scrutinised by Parliament, but also not creating an extra layer of bureaucracy and, and work um, that puts perhaps ministers off um, engaging properly with, with interparliamentary structures. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that. Um, I mean, notwithstanding the points raised regarding civil servants, um, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, anything, uh, anything that's happening now is certainly an improvement. Uh, upon IGR, because what was there beforehand just wasn't fit for purpose in any way, shape or form. Uh, it was very much a, a failure. Uh, so with the new process um, that's there, which certainly I, uh, I welcome the fact that progress uh, certainly been made. Um, so it's no longer ad hoc, uh, but also it's not uh, in a statutory provision. Uh, it seems to be somewhere in between. Um, do you think it should actually be in a statutory footing? I'm neither convinced nor unconvinced <laughs> by the statutory footing. I think, uh, and, and I think uh, Seoul, the Seoul Convention shows the, some of the, the distrust around what, what placing intergovernmental relations on a statutory footing would mean. Um, and I think one of the things that the UK government or, or UK politics did well until Brexit was to keep things out of the courts. Um, to try and deal with things politically. This is not the case, for example, in Spain, where we have a politicisation of the judiciary and a judicialisation of, polit of, of politics, and, and that's something that you know, I'd be keen to avoid in, in the case of the UK. Um, I think statutory voting has a symbolic importance. Um, it's there to say you know, we need uh, that these intergovernmental relations are important, they should take place. Um, but if you look at cases around uh, you know, other federal or devolved systems, um, very few form, you know, the most important intergovernmental mechanism is normally not uh, required, you know, grounded in statutory footing. And, and I think I put in my briefing paper the, the, in India is, is an exception here. In Spain, you have um, a more sort of legal framework around intergovernmental relations. And, and here there's an expectation that, um, or, or sort of a legal requirement that information is published, that, that information is shared and, and things like this. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have effective uh, relations. The Catalan government post-2017 referendum didn't want to engage in multilateral relations um, with the Spanish government. You know, what's the punishment for that under... Um, if there's a legal provision saying you have to do it. So uh, I can understand why it's there. Um, and I think there's an important symbolic um, issue around it, but I'm not convinced, you know, it doesn't mean you're going to have effective intergovernmental relations. Uh, very, very quickly running out of time. We've only got about five minutes left. So um, I'm going to allow an answer to, to Stuart Bamassi to limit it to not one word, but one sentence, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, basically, I'd agree with Paul. I think we can't return to the situation where uh, the, these uh, like bodies like the JMC just aren't meeting. I think that's completely unacceptable. But fundamentally, what it really needs is, is political will um, from all four governments to, to continue to, to meet. And that's not an easy thing to, uh, to fabricate. Um, but I, I certainly hope that uh, post this review, there will be renewed impetus on those structures. I think I think statutory requirements are are symbolically important, but but as Jess said, it it returns to political law. Thank you. Well, in the interest of time, I'll try and bundle my questions into one, so it'll probably be two parts. And I just want to firstly explore. Um, we've uh, discussed around the change in the culture. Um, I used to work at the Murray-Darling River Basin Commission in Australia, which was a tricky 
process, uh, attempting to manage finite water resources between competing states and indeed competing actors within states. Um, so I j just wondered your thoughts, because we've also mentioned a, a sectoral conference as well, or, or some other uh, body to, to look at a specific issue. Um, but even with that, is the structures um, sufficient where it's in political interests for intergovernmental re relations not to work uh, very well. And uh, I think beyond the sectorial conferences where I think sharing best practice on specific issues is, is a really good point and would be welcomed. You know, Wales have done fantastically on recycling. There's a model there that could be rolled out, certainly in Scotland, but more challenging in England. Um, but is there something beyond sharing best practice within those structures. So who would like to begin? Okay. Um, I think where you see intergovernmental relations and work work quite well beyond information sharing is when there's a specific project or, or a specific need. In Canada, we see um, regional cooperation on environmental issues around pipelines, around renewables. Um, so when you ha bring governments together to work on a specific project, which is in their shared interest, which has cross-border implications, um, I think that's an, that's an important opportunity for intergovernmental relations um, and, and takes it beyond that kind of information sharing function and builds that record of trust and cooperation and collaboration. And so we, we do see that quite a bit in, in Canada, for specific coordination, particularly on the environment, which is, of course, a kind of cross-cutting issue. So. Okay. Jess? Yeah, just to, to echo some of what uh, Corey said, I think where there is the real potential for all four governments to see the benefit of IGR is, is on these kind of policy issues where they have a shared interest like climate change, like food standards. And, you know, that is happening, actually. You know, uh, one of the post-Brexit freedoms that the UK government mentioned in its um, paper was around kind of uh, new action to prevent puppy smuggling. That is something that's being implemented GB-wide um, on the basis of the agreement of, of um, all the governments, even though it's a devolved area. Similarly, something like the, the adding folic acid to bread, which was recently agreed between um, the four governments because it was understood that actually implementing it only in Scotland wouldn't actually be effective because um, supply chains are UK-wide. So those things are happening. The problem is sometimes the big constitutional issues do get in the way. Um, and I think although Brexit is somewhat kind of behind us and that will help to some extent, I think um, there's going to be a tough time ahead with um, you know, potential for a second independence referendum, um, ongoing um, disagreement over the Northern Ireland Protocol. It is going to be challenging, but hopefully setting up these new um, inter ministerial groups will allow ministers to continue those discussions at a policy level, mm -hmm. um, even when um, the kind of high-level politics might be a bit more difficult. Thanks. Yeah, uh, just very briefly on political culture. I think political culture is the main issue around um, getting more effective intergovernmental relations in the UK. Um, the, unlike other sort of federal states where you have this political culture of compromise, um, negotiation, um, the, the UK doesn't, you know, this has not been the experience of intergovernmental relations in the UK um, since um, 1999. And I think here a lot of the, the onus is sometimes on the devolved governments that perhaps have a different constitutional vision and so therefore, you know, you can say they don't want it to work, but it is within the interest of all governments to, to at least cooperate together. But at the same time, I think, you know, this is very clear within the UK government where ministers have attended these meetings in the past because they're told to attend. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was whole debate around these new arrangements, whether or not the Prime Minister should chair um, the main uh, committee and there seemed to be retinence that, that that would be the case for the Prime Minister, which of course the Prime Minister um, should be involved in these. Um, so I think as well it's about trying to, uh, the political culture around whether or not Westminster think intergovernmental relations are important, um, as well as the devolved governments, but also building up this political culture of trust, of um, good faith negotiations, of working together and willing to um, to come together and work on, on common issues. And I think um, if intergovernmental relations are going to improve that, there needs to be a change in mindset in, in how, they, uh, how governments approach um, intergovernmental relations. On paper, there is. Um, whether or not that happens in, at a practical level rem remains to be seen, but I, I 
I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I think here the important thing to say is the Mude music, once the new, relation, once the new arrangements were published, um, Westminster, the Westminster government, Michael Gove, said, you know, these are going to be great and it's going to revolutionise relations. Um, that was not the case from, from the words from uh, any of the representatives from Stormont, uh, from the Welsh government, the, Brit the Scottish government or, or the Northern Irish um, executive. It was much more cautious with, with we will see. Um, so I think political culture is the main uh, issue and, and uh, that's certainly something that, that should um, and, and, will, and will have to change if, if intergovernmental relations are to become uh, better and more effective. Thank I'm you, afraid we're going to have to call it a, a, a day for this, this agenda item. Can I thank you all for your attendance at committee this morning? It's been a very um, interesting session. I, I'm going to close this meeting. We do ha have a, a further agenda item in private, so could I ask people that are not um, in the room for that to please exit as quickly as possible. And I'm sorry to do that, but it's parliamentary timetables on a Thursday. <laughs> thank you.